I am General of the Army Ulysses S. Grant, and you join me this day in the war room. And I should like to take the opportunity to wax nostalgic a bit and look back down the long and dusty corridor of the halls of time and reflect upon my graduating class at the United States Military Academy, West Point, class of 1843. We graduated, and I with the class, on July 1st of 1843. Uh, this greatly pleased me, and uh, equally so greatly surprised me that I should graduate. I never thought I would. And in looking back at the class, I think it can be well described, indeed, it was well described by faculty as, with one word, as undistinguished. Uh, they, uh, we think they were joking, perhaps they were serious, when the mutterings among staff and faculty were that this was unquestionably the most undistinguished class, or perhaps better to say the least distinguished class that the Academy had ever produced. Uh, but I will leave that for your reflection. In looking back at it, we began our classes in the bivouac, the tenting, on the plain in the summer, May and June of 1839. There were about 100 cadets that had uh, come together to begin the West Point curriculum. In fact, there was another cadet from, I believe, New York State who had the same name of U.S. Grant. When we began classes in the fall of 1839, we were down to 76 cadets. <clears throat> and by the time we graduated, July the 1st of 1843, we graduated 39 cadets. I understand the attrition rates run uh, very similar even unto this day, but we started with 100 uh, encampment, began classes with 76, graduated 39. Our cadets in that class came from 14 different states and one from the District of Columbia. The first person in the class, number one, was William Buell Franklin. And William B. Franklin went on to be a major general in the Civil War and indeed commanded the 14th Corps. So number one became a major general commanding of a corps. The last man in the class, number 39, was George C. McClelland. That's McClelland with a D, not the other George McClellan. And uh, he was later cashiered out of the service for drunkenness in 1847. Also cashiered from that class was William K. Van Bakkelen. And he was cashiered in 1861 uh, as a quartermaster officer for misappropriation of, I believe it was $225 in federal funding. But he <laughs> went back in the Army, re-enlisted, and uh, was assigned to the 7th Infantry. So apparently the Army got over its uh, disturbance over the $225, but Bachlin was cashiered and then managed to get back in. You may be curious, of that 39, who served in the late War of the Great Rebellion? I would begin <clears throat> by telling you who didn't. 18 of that 39 did not serve in the War of the Rebellion, and they didn't serve because three were killed in the Mexican War. So out of our class of 39, almost all of us went into the Mexican War, but three were killed. Eight died between graduation in 1843 and the war starting in 1861. Of note that I will address a bit later, uh, a spectacular note, I should think, was number two in the class, George Deshawn. George served 14 years 
in the army, seven of them, or 14 of them teaching at the academy, and he resigned, converted to Catholicism, and became a uh, notable Catholic priest. In fact, became one of the founding priests of the Paulist order, but more about George in a moment. Four of the 18 who did not serve resigned, and as I have mentioned, there were two who were cashiered out of the service, although one did get back in. The ranks of the men who graduated in 39 that were amassed in the War of the Rebellion, there were four colonels, six brigadier generals, and I am including brevet ranks because they were given that title during the war. So I am recognizing it as such. Uh, four colonels, six brigadier generals, six major generals, one lieutenant general, and one brigadier general that was not confirmed by the Senate. And in fact, the appointment was revoked, sadly enough. For the ranks attained for the CSA, there was one colonel, one brigadier general, and two major generals. Four of our 1843 class members went south. They were Edmonds B. Holloway. Now, Edmonds B. Holloway graduated 19th in the class of 39, and he was appointed to the uh, United States Military Academy from Kentucky. And when the war started, he chose the lot of the Confederate States of America and became a colonel in the Missouri State Guard. And in May of 61, he was killed in action. Uh, regrettably, he was killed by a shot fired by one of his own men. And also, remarkably, ironically, uh, even more so, he is the only one of our graduates who was killed in action. Edmonds B. Holloway, USMA, class of 43, Colonel, Confederate States Army, killed in action by one of his own men in May of 61 in Missouri as Colonel of the Missouri State Guard. The other officers who went south were Roswell Sabine Ripley. Roswell Ripley graduated in USMA class of 43, seventh in ranking in the class. He was appointed to the academy from New York. He became a brigadier general in the Confederate States Army and also wrote a two-volume treatise, A History of the War with Mexico. A History of the War with Mexico, lengthy writing. A third member of the class of 43 that went south was Franklin Gardner. Franklin graduated 17th in the class. He was appointed from Iowa and became a major general in the Confederate States Army. Of note for Frank Gardner, he was the commanding officer of the bastion at Port Hudson, on the Mississippi River below Vicksburg. At the same time, I was besieging and captured Vicksburg. I think that a note of irony for what was happening to West Point graduates, one besieging Vicksburg, one uh, defending Port Hudson. Port Hudson did not fall. Nathaniel Banks attempted several times to take it, but Frank Gardner had uh, defended it well. He did surrender, I believe it was on July the 9th when he surrendered, uh, when he, be, he got a newspaper and was uh, convinced that Vicksburg had indeed surrendered. So my classmate, Frank Gardner, was commanding Port Hudson just below me while I was besieging Vicksburg. And the fourth United States Military Academy class of 43 graduate who went south and the last one was Samuel G. French, Samuel Gibbs French, and he graduated 14th in a class. He was appointed to the academy from New Jersey and became a major general in the Confederate States Army. 
of the notable people that I should like to lift up to you that graduated in that class, uh, Fred Dent. Now, Fred graduated 33rd in the class, but he became my brother-in-law. In fact, Fred urged me that when I graduated, if I was stationed at Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, that I should go out to Whitehaven, his family home, where he and all his siblings, brothers and sisters, were born. And in fact, one of his siblings, Julia, his oldest sister, was there. And I accepted his invitation when I was indeed stationed at Jefferson Barracks. And uh, perhaps of interest, I arrived there in August at Jefferson Barracks and began calling on the Dent family once a week, August through February. When Julia returned home from finishing school in St. Louis with the O'Fallon family, people of note in society, and I, I believe he was a War of 1812 hero, uh, she came home and we met. And then I began calling at Whitehaven daily. So my future brother-in-law was one of my classmates at the academy. Another one of my classmates and a roommate for one year, the last year I was there, my fourth year, and in fact, Fred Dent was also one of my roommates. Rufus Ingalls roomed with me my last year, and Ruf Ingalls graduated 32nd in the class of 39. Ruf uh, served with me at Fort Vancouver, out in the Columbia, the Oregon Territory on the Columbia River, and uh, rose to become a general, brigadier general on his own in the War of the Rebellion, and was in fact my quartermaster general during my last year, uh, or the last year of the war, my year in the Eastern Theater in 64 and 65. So Rufus Ingalls became quite the quartermaster. Rufus is also uh, credited, uh, he developed the idea of marking, painting wagons because he uh, felt that, and he was correct, the supplies, war material, were not getting equally distributed through the ranks. The closest soldiers to the supply wagons got all of the supplies. Roof de uh, determined to paint the wagons with what they were carrying, ammunition, food, forage for the animals, or medical supplies, and each wagon had its regiment designation painted on it. So instead of when the wagons arrived at the army, all the supplies were dumped to the cl soldiers closest. With Roof Engel's system, the wagons all distributed throughout the army to their designated regiments, and everybody was equally supplied. Nobody went wanting. So that was quite an improvement for Roof. Also, he developed the, the circular motion, even having the pioneers cut a parallel road that when we were on the Overland Campaign particularly, but throughout the war, uh, the last year of the war, there was a road cut beside the primary road. So as loaded wagons went to their destination, <clears throat> when they were unloaded, they returned on an alternate road, so there's no traffic jam, there's no bottlenecking, and the supplies were kept moving. Loaded wagons into the army, empty wagons out by another road. Uh, a simple but brilliant move on the part of Ruth Ingalls. And I mentioned earlier and said I would address later, George Deshawn, who graduated second in the class of 1843. George uh, was in the Army for 14 years, and in 1851, he converted to Catholicism. In 52, he resigned and became a Catholic priest. He went further in the priesthood, though, because in just a few years, he w was one of the founding fathers, to make a bit of a pun, for the Society of the Apostolic Life called the Missionary Society of St. Paul the Apostle. And George was instrumental in building St. Paul's Cathedral in New York City. 
where he lived the remainder of his life and is in fact buried in that church. He's entombed in that church. It was the uh, first house and church of the society and built in New York City in 1859, and George was buried there. In 1860, Father George now published a book entitled Guide for Catholic Young Women, Especially Those Who Earn Their Own Living. Guide for Catholic Young Women, Especially for Those Who own, Earn Their Own Living, which is still in print today. I guess the times they were a-changing to dedicate a book for women who were earning their own living. There are not many who earn their own living. But we're all proud of George. He has distinguished himself uh, being a warrior in another venue rather than in the army. The last person that I should like to lift up for you is not a pleasant one. Joseph Jones Reynolds. Now, Joseph J. Reynolds graduated 10th in the class and became a major general in the War of the Rebellion, served well, distinguished himself. He taught for nine years at the academy, and he fought for the Union during the war between the states, and then, as a colonel, when the war was over, he stayed in the army. He reverted back to his regular army rank of colonel, in fact, as did George Custer. George Custer had carried a major general brevet rank in the war, but when he went out west after the War of the Rebellion was over, he was a lieutenant colonel. So that was his actual regular army rank. Once having given the rank of brevet or by brevet, you are entitled always to be addressed by that rank. And that's why whenever uh, George Custer is referenced, he is always addressed as general. Custer, even though his real army rank was lieutenant colonel. But Joseph J. Reynolds reverted to colonel rank and went out west to fight Indians on the western frontier. But in connection with the fighting of the Indians on the frontier, he abandoned a wounded soldier who was later found by the Indians and hacked to death. And because of that, Joseph Reynolds was court-martialed and found guilty and was allowed to resign from the army. So he is one of the resignations. And that is what I should like to talk with you about and reflect with you about the class of 1843. We were, with head shaking, described as undistinguished and probably wasn't going to amount to anything, none of the members, and yet we did. Uh, four colonels, six brevet uh, brigadier generals, six brigadier generals, six major generals, one lieutenant general, uh, four men fought for the South. One of them was a colonel holding the dubious honor of being the only one of the 1843 Academy graduates to be killed in action, he was killed fighting for the Confederacy, uh, a brigadier general, two major generals in the Confederate Army, a man who was one of the founding fathers of the Paulist order and indeed was instrumental in building a cathedral in New York City. So I think that we more than distinguished ourselves, and I hope those old heads on the staff there and faculty at the Academy, if they should be ever be made aware of how well we did, I hope that they'll change their mind and express that we were of distinguishing character in our class. But that is all that I have to say about the United States Military Academy class of 1843, and I must be about my business. So until the next time that we should come together for reflections, I am General of the Army, Ulysses S. Grant, bidding you a fond farewell.